Okay, so welcome to part two of 2020 EM Changes MDM. All right, so as we go through this, you'll see you have the different levels. You have minimal, you have low, moderate, and high. So let's kind of flip through these really quickly. Minimum is like a self-limited problem. And that is defined, if you go back to your definitions, that's defined. Basically, a, an, a physician doesn't necessarily have to be there to, to handle this problem. All right, low. Low is two, you, you have an option here. You have, if it's two or more self-limited, so if you have two of those small problems the patient came in for, two or more, then it would be low. If you had one stable chronic, so say a patient came in with their um, hypertension that was well under control, their diabetes well under control, their COPD well under control, then that would fall into that category. And uh, or if the patient had one acute uncomplicated illness or injury. And like I said, you'll see a lot of these terms are defined. So uh, you can get some really good, you know, you don't have to guess on a lot of these. They're very clear about what they're talking about. All right, moderate. Moderate is if you have one or more chronic illness with an exacerbation, progression, side effect of treatment. Notice I did not say severe exacerbation. I just said with exacerbation. So COPD with exacerbation. Um, let's see. What about diabetes where their, uh, their blood sugars are not well controlled? Not off the charts, but they're not where you want them to be. They're not optimal. That's what I would put there. Things like that. Hypertension where they're, they're, they're on one medicine maybe and it's just not quite getting those blood, blood pressures where you want them. So when you have patients that are not optimal, they're not or progression, you have a patient whose uh, condition is progressively getting worse, but it's not severe yet. And then you have side effects of treatment, like um, just say you put a patient on a lipid drug and it caused stomach upset or whatever. I don't, I don't know what some of the side effects of that are, but so just kind of regular side effects of treatment, nothing super complicated, not, nothing super bad. Um, nothing life-threatening. Now, what if you have two or more stable chronic illnesses? That would be moderate. So if I came in and I had diabetes and hyperlipidemia and they were both stable, that would be good. How about if you had an undiagnosed new problem? So a patient comes in and they've been having palpitations or they've been having um, a, a lump in their breast or I'm trying to think of another one. Um so it's a new problem, and you're going to have to do some work to get to the bottom of what is the new problem because we don't it's not diagnosed yet, and you don't know you know it's an uncertain prognosis. You're not sure if this is severe or not because you hadn't gotten any further than that. You're just getting to the point where you're starting to test do some tests and run some labs and maybe do some x-rays to figure out what's going on. Or it can be one acute illness with systemic symptoms, pyelonephritis, um, Trying to think of some other ones. That one was on the wrist table from last time. That's how I know that one. Um, so if they come in and they have an acute illness and they're having systemic sy symptoms like maybe a fever, uh, shortness of breath, those kind of things. And also you, the last one is one acute complicated injury. So this could be like a head injury. And I think it was without like a head injury without loss of, of consciousness because I believe loss of consciousness falls under high. So there is an idea of what you're, what you're talking about with moderate. So let's go to high. High is one or more chronic illnesses with severe exacerbations, progressions, or side effects of treatment. So you have a patient who has COPD, and then they're having severe respiratory issues. They're having a severe exacerbation. They're having trouble breathing. They're, hypo they're getting hypoxic, that kind of thing. That would be high. Uh, let's see, what about an acute... The, the next one is an acute or chronic illness or injury that poses a threat to life or bodily function. A patient that is, you, you suspect MI, a patient who um, has a, a head injury with loss of consciousness, a patient having a seizure, those kind of things fit into this category. A high-level patient is one that you would very likely consider sending to the ED or admitting from the office. Okay, going to the next level or the next element. The next element is amount and or date, a complexity of data to be reviewed and analyzed. This very similar to your data table 
in the 1995-1997 guidelines. Very, very similar, but don't be... Don't get it twisted. It is different. It's similar, but not the same. All right, so category one. We're going to look at, first of all, notice that for the 99202 and 99212 that you can get away with minimal or no data reviewed or analyzed. But when you get to level three, which is low decision making, it's, it's considered limited data and you would meet at least one of the you you would have to have it says meet the requirements of at least one of the two categories so you have category one and category two category one is all about your test and documents so like the labs that you order the labs that you review that kind of thing would fall in here ekgs that you order ekgs that you reviewed Imaging that you ordered, imaging that you review, all that is in this section right here. And it's each unique test. So that is actually defined for you pretty well in the definitions. We're going to go over there and I'm going to show you that in just a second because I've already gotten emails and questions from physicians asking me what, what constitutes a test. Like for a lab, is it per each individual labs. So if you have a lab panel, like say a comprehensive metabolic panel, do I get to count each lab that's done in that panel? No. And that is defined. I'm going to show you where they define that. But say you ran two, you ran a pan, two panels, then you would get credit for two. Or say you ordered two panels, you get credit for ordering two panels. But say you ordered an A1C, and a urinalysis, that's two. Say you ordered a renal panel and a CBC, that's two. Say you reviewed an A1C and ordered a renal panel, that's two points. So, um, yeah, a lot more fun than the 1995 and 97 guidelines because you get to count things more. In the 1995 and 97 guidelines, if you were to order, you could order a ton of labs, it's considered one point. That, I always had a problem with that. I always thought that was so unfair. Because when a doctor is deciding to order labs or a doctor is reviewing labs, then they are having to think about each one of those labs and how that affects the, what the results of those labs mean to the patient's condition. And to give them credit one point, regardless of how many labs they order or review, that was, to me, that was never fair. And so this is a lot more fair. And it makes a lot more sense. So let's go look at those definitions since I've been yabbering on about them. See, I have my own little vocabulary too, by the way. So let's see if I can find the labs. Test. Okay. Okay. Let's zoom in here, see where it says test. And it says test R is going to be your imaging, your laboratory, your psychometric, your physiological data, all of that. A clinical lab panel, this is what I was just talking about. Example, a basic metabolic panel, which is CPT code 80047, is a considered a single test. So a renal panel is one test. A metabolic panel, one test. A Chem 7, one test. Um, CBC, one test. Okay. Let's say you order one panel and you review a panel. Say you had a panel that they had done, that you had them do before they came in, and you reviewed that panel. And then you decided, oh, you know what? Based on some things that came up during this visit, I also need to run a lipid panel on this patient. So you get credit for reviewing, say, the... Let's say they had a, a basic metabolic panel that you reviewed, and then you decide, I need to do a lipid panel on them. So you send them for a lipid panel. That's two points because you reviewed a lab and you ordered a lab. What if, if you reviewed two panels? And I, like I said, I already discussed this, but say you reviewed basic metabolic panel, and then you also reviewed a renal panel. I don't, I don't know if it's appropriate to order those together. I don't know. I can't remember. I haven't done lab in a while. But you would get two points because you reviewed two panels. You do not get points for every single test in a panel. You only get 
points for the panel, but if you have to review more than one panel, you get credit for reviewing each panel. I hope I made that clear. It will probably become a lot more clear when we start doing some examples, because I am going to do some, you know, some faux auditing so you guys can see what I mean, so we can illustrate some of these concepts a little bit better. So let's get out of here and go back in here. So here we are in the categories of the data. Alrighty, I'm sorry. I'm s there we go. Zoomed back in. All right, so that's all about the t category one, which is test and documents. Category two is assessment requiring an independent historian. What I'd like to do now is go back out there and look at the definitions and see if we can find independent historian. An independent historian is an individual, uh, it could be the parent, guardian, surrogate, spouse, witness, who provides history in addition to the history provided by the patient, who is unable to provide a complete or reliable history, say due to developmental delay or their age or dementia or psychosis or because of a or because a confirmatory history is judged to be necessary. In the case where there are there may be conflict, conflicted or poor communication between multiple historians or more than one historian is needed, the, um, the independent historian requirement is met. Okay, so say you have a patient that comes in and he's maybe he's an elderly man who has dementia and you, you're getting a history from him, but you realize that he's not giving you a reliable history, so you have to bring his daughter or his son or his wife into the equation and say and, and start getting history from them because you can't rely on the history you're getting. That's an independent historian. So let's go back to the grid and take a look at that. Assessment requiring an independent historian. So you would get credit for that. So let's say... Notice it says, we must meet the requirements of at least one of the two categories. So say we didn't run any labs on this patient. Say we didn't do, you didn't do any of that. But you were dealing with a patient that you had to get some independent history from the wife, the daughter, the son, because the patient couldn't give it to you. So make sure you document that clear. And then that would, if you had that, that would... Clear that would right there give you the limited that you needed. So that would put you automatically at a low by itself. If you had, if you wanted to do category one for the low, if you had two of the following, say you reviewed a lab and say you ordered a lab, there you go, you're at low, boom, you're done with this category, right? All right, moderate's where it gets a little bit messier. When you get to moderate and high in this kind of in this column, it does get a little bit messier. So, you see in parentheses it says you must meet the requirements of at least one of the three categories. So, there you pick the category and let's look at each one. So, for category 1, that's your test, documents, or independent historians. So, you need to get, come up with, to qualify for category one, you need to come up with a combination of three of the follow, from the following. Three points, right? So review of prior, prior external notes from each unique source. So that's if, say, say you have a patient, it's a new patient, and they come in and you've had their records sent over from their old doctor. If you reviewed that and you document you reviewed that, that'd be a point there. And then review of the results of each unique test. If you ran, a, if you were reviewing labs, X-rays, anything like that, you would count that there. Ordering of each unique test. Say you ordered. So you see the patient. Maybe they were referred to you if you're a specialist, or maybe they're a new patient. If you're say internal medicine or family medicine or primary care patient is coming to you as a new patient and they maybe they brought their records over or whatnot but that you're having to order some tests on them say you order a lab or two on them and um, so that would fall under the category of ordering say you ordered a lab and an EKG and an x-ray that's three points right there from ordering of each unique test Category two. So we're going to talk about how category two works. So category two is independent interpretation of test. 
So say you have a patient that's an established patient comes to the office and um, they bring with them, say, let's say you are a neurologist and they bring their CT scan with them or they bring their MRI or it was sent over before their visit, right? If you do an independent review of that MRI, that CT, you have to actually look at the, if it's an EKG, you have to look at the strip. Um, if it's a CT, you need to look at the scan results. You don't read the report, you look at the scan results. All right, let's look at category three. So for category three, it says discussion of, of management or test interpretation with external physicians or other qualified health professional appropriate source, not separately reportable. Say you've had a um, say you had a lab done. Say you sent the patient for an out a lab, and you had to reach out to the pathologist about this lab. What if the patient had maybe a um, a biopsy, and you get the biopsy results back, and you have questions about them, and you had to reach out to the pathologist. That right there gives you complete credit for category three. All right, and then extensive. Moving on to the high category or extensive. Uh, you must meet the requirements of at least two of the three categories. So you don't you don't get to just say, oh, I got category one, boom, I'm done. You have to get category two of these categories of the three. So it is pretty much the same thing as you have above, but we've added that we have to get, stop, stop, stop. <laughs> we've added that we have to get, we have to hit two of the three categories. To continue on, click on the next video, which will be um, 2021 Changes MDM Part 3.